And then the other really interesting thing is the constant parallel between Moses and Elijah and Joshua and Elisha. And I think that that's incredibly interesting because... Welcome to Uncaged Bible Study. We hope our name gives it away as we are looking to unleash God's word in its entirety from beginning to end and unlock the power within the pages of scripture. We aim to restore the authority of God's word in a world that has lost its understanding of doctrinal truths, as well as shed a light on how from the first page to the last page, the Bible is pointing us towards Messiah, our Savior, Jesus. So we hope you enjoy the Bible study today. And if you did, follow us or share the podcast to help us spread the word around the globe. And if you leave us a five-star review, that's a great way to let us know that you say amen and are impacted by what you've heard. So thank you for joining us on this journey. And in the words of Charles Spurgeon, the Bible is like a caged lion. It does not need to be defended. It simply needs to be let out of its cage. Let's unlock the cage together. Father God, thank you for the chance to to get together and dig into your word and and keep investigating and experiencing the history of your chosen nation Israel. God, I ask that you would just be with us tonight. You know, open our minds and hearts and help us to see who you are. Help us to see your plan. Help us to see what you have hidden for us in your word. And God, I just I thank you for the opportunity this evening. In other news, I just want to lift up the the people in Turkey and Syria right now and what they are dealing with. And it's it's tragic and it's it's heartbreaking. Uh, and it just isn't stopping. The earth is still shaking over there. Um, there's still pretty monstrous aftershocks. And uh, God, I just want to ask you to, to, to be with them. I hope that they can see you through it all. I hope people have come to you uh, in their time of need. And God, I just, I just pray for the, the rebuilding effort and and for the lives of the people who have to deal with tragedy, um, that you would help them get through. And uh, God, we just lift them up and put them in your hands. In Jesus' name, amen. So we are in Second Kings, uh, which actually... You know, originally, in terms of the scrolls, the ancient Hebrew scrolls, this just would have been part of the same book. Um, so they're separated in our Bible because I don't know why. But they are. But it's actually just one scroll, and it's the continued history of both the kings of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. Uh, and we're still kind of following, really, the prophets Elijah and Elisha. And what we're going to get into tonight is... Really, Elijah handing over the ministry to Elisha. So that's what we're going to see tonight. Let's let's dig in. So, Second Kings chapter one, verse one. Moab rebelled against Israel after the death of Ahab. So right away, what you're seeing is kind of the turmoil that happens when one of the monarchs passes away. Now, Moab had been under the control of Israel for quite a while. But because the king had passed away and there was a bit of a power vacuum and things to figure out, this was their time to try to pounce and take back their sovereignty. So that's what they're doing. And they rebel against Israel uh, after Ahab's death. Now, Ahaziah, who is Ahab's son, uh, fell through the lattice of his upper room in Samaria and was injured. So he sent messengers and said to them, Go inquire of Baal, Baalzebub, the god of Ekron, whether I shall recover from this injury. So the son of, of Ahab, who took his place, is Ahaziah. And Ahaziah, for some reason, falls off of a balcony that had lattice, which is not really a strong material. Just falls through, gets himself hurt. And now, instead of asking for God's help, or even asking for physical help from a physician or someone in Israel, he actually asks someone to go seek out 
a pagan god in Philistine, Israel's enemy, and a false god. And so he asks them to get information from Baalzebub. Verse 3, but the angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite, now keep in mind the angel of the Lord, right? Lord, all capitalized. So what does this typically mean in the Old Testament? That this is likely a, a situation where Jesus takes on a physical form in the Old Testament and confronts someone. So you have the angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite, arise, go up to meet the messengers of the king of Samaria. And say to them, is it because there is no God in Israel that you're going to inquire of Baalzebub, the God of Ekron? So this is what you have. God is not happy with this. Now there's been enough going on in the northern kingdom of Israel. There's been a succession of kings, starting with Jeroboam, now all the way to Ahaziah. You've had as evil as it gets with Ahab and and, uh, Jezebel. And they just do not get the message. Over and over and over again, they have kings who are evil and reap the judgment of God from it. And now you have this guy who's taken over for Ahab, hasn't done anything but hurt himself, and still refuses to be humble to God. And he requests a pagan God's influence from Israel's number one enemy, Philistine. And so God confronts Elijah and tells him to go deal with Ahaziah's men. And his response is, is it that there's no God in Israel? Basically saying, why do you keep not looking at me? How do you constantly not see who's in control here? Now, therefore, thus says the Lord, you shall not come down from the bed to which you have gone up, but you shall surely die. So that's what he tells Elijah to tell uh, Ahaziah's men. Tells Ahaziah's men, what's the problem? Is there no God in Israel? Basically saying, how do you not recognize the God of Israel and all that he's done for us? And because you refuse to do so, you're not getting better, you're going to die. So that's Elijah's message. And when the messengers returned to him, he said to him, why have you come back? So they said to him, so Ahaziah's messengers go out. They've spoken to Elijah. Elijah gave them this message. And they and the messengers returned to Ahaziah, and uh, they said to him, "A man has come up to meet us and said, go, said to us, go return to the king who sent you, and say to him, thus says the Lord, it is because there is no God. Is it because there is no God in Israel that you are sending to inquire of Baalzebub, the god of Ekron? Therefore, you shall not come down from the bed to which you have gone up, but you shall surely die." So the messengers come to Ahaziah and they give him the bad news. Say some guy told us to tell you while we were on our way to do your bidding, some guy freaked us out, caught us on the way, and told us that you're going to die, and God is mad at you. So we turned around, and now we're telling you this. So King, he says to them, what kind of man was it who came up to meet you and told you these words? Now listen carefully to the description that he gives. So they answered him, a hairy man, wearing a leather belt around his waist. And the king said, it is Elijah the Tishbite. And so who does he sound like? Like a wild, crazy, hairy guy uh, with a leather belt. He sounds a little bit like John the Baptist, as he should, because John the Baptist came in the spirit of Elijah. So it's just foreshadowing to the Messiah. But the king knows when he hears the description of Elijah So he must have been a unique character, much like John the Baptist. He knew exactly who it was. And so the king sent to to him a captain of 50 with his 50 men. And so he went up to him, and there he was sitting on the top of a hill. And he spoke to him, man of God, the king has said, come down. So this is what you have going on. After the king finds out, that it's Elijah who gave this bad news to his messengers. He says, okay, I'm going to send members of my army after Elijah. And so he sends a captain with 50 men to go see Elijah. And his response is, go say to him, oh man of God, which sounds nice. But then the next thing is, come down. 
So it's not humility. It's not repentance at all. This is nothing like when David was confronted with his sin. David repented and was humbled and said he didn't deserve anything that God gave him. But Ahaziah thinks that he owns Elijah because he's the king, and he tells his men to go get him and bring him back. So they say, man of God, come down. And Elijah answered the captain of 50 and said, if I am a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50 men. And fire came down from heaven and consumed him and his 50. So then he sent to him another captain of 50 with his 50 men. This is how prideful and stubborn and quite frankly stupid Ahaziah is. 50 men go to get Elijah of his well-trained army and they get burnt up to a crisp. So his response is, let's send 50 more. And he answered and said to him, man of God, thus has the king said, come down quickly. So they added a word. Instead of just come down, now it's come down quickly. He's really putting his foot down as though he's on the throne and God isn't. And Elijah answered and said to them, if I am a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50 men. And the fire of God came down from heaven and consumed him and his 50. Again, he sent a third captain of 50, 50 men. And the third captain of 50 went up and came and fell on his knees before Elijah. Notice it's different this time. I don't know if Ahaziah had a different message, but the captain at least knew I'm going to react a little bit differently than my predecessors because he wasn't an idiot. And so he falls down on his knees and he pleads with Elijah and says to him, man of God, please let my life and the life of these 50 servants of yours be precious in your sight. Look, fire has come down from heaven and burned up the first two captains of 50s with their 50s, but let my life now be precious in your sight. And the angel of the Lord said to Elijah, go down with him, do not be afraid of him. So he arose and went down with him to the king. So finally, someone comes with a little bit of humility. And God's response was, Elijah, go with him. Now, here's the interesting thing about this exchange. The three times Ahaziah sends 50 men to go collect Elijah. But twice... Elijah calls fire down from heaven to consume them. By the way, this isn't the first time that Elijah calls down fire from heaven. He did this to Ahab when he took on the 450 prophets of Baal. Who's he fighting now? Another god in the Baal family, Baal Zebub. And so he's calling fire down from heaven. So this is a connection point where Elijah is again establishing God as the one in control and the one who chooses the the destiny of Israel and the fate. It's also an interesting point because this gives us insight into Elijah. Now, if you remember from our study in Revelation, which was now a long time ago, there are two witnesses in Revelation chapter 11. This is the description of the two witnesses. It starts in verse 3 in Revelation 11. It says, I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1260 days clothed in sackcloth. So you have a description of, in Revelation, there's a seven-year period of, of God's judgment. 1260 days is half of that period. So for three and a half years, there's going to be two, two witnesses prophesying, basically preaching the truth of who God is, and they're going to be clothed in sackcloth in humility. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone would harm them, what happens? Fire pours from their mouth and consumes their foes. If anyone would harm them, this is how he is doomed to be killed. Well, that sounds like Elijah. Elijah, They will call down fire from heaven. They will breathe fire from heaven through their mouths. And then it says they have the power to shut the sky that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying. And they have the power 
over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they desire. Now that's verses 3 through 6 of Revelation 11. Now, several times we now see Elijah calling down fire from heaven to consume his enemies. We know that Elijah's ministry started with him calling a drought in Israel and ended upon his prayer. And then the next two things are being able to turn the waters to blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague, which sounds a whole lot like Moses, which also happened to be the two people that meet Jesus on the mount during his transfiguration before his crucifixion. So it seems like they're going to be the two characters. Elijah is not debated because even Jesus himself says that Elijah is still to come before his return. So you get some real insight into this guy and how important he is to the biblical story. He's the he's the prophet. He calls down fire from heaven. He's going to return and prophesy before the second coming of Christ. And he is a forerunner of John the Baptist who comes in the spirit of Elijah to tell about Jesus' first coming. So it's an important guy. And this is one of the last acts of his ministry. And he tells Ahaziah that he's he's going to die. So after this third captain comes down and Elijah is told by the angel of the Lord to go see the king, we pick up in verse 16. It says, Then he said to him, Thus says the Lord, because you have sent messengers to inquire of Baalzebub, the god of Ekron, it is, because, is it because there is no God in Israel to inquire of his word? Therefore, you shall not come down to the bed uh, to which you have gone up, but you shall surely die. So the same message is given to him to tell Ahaziah. You're going to die because you refuse to believe in God, the God who has done everything for the kingdom of Israel. So Ahaziah died according to the word of the Lord, which Elijah had spoken. Because he had no son, Jehoram became king in his place in the second year of Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. Now that is a very confusing verse because you now have two kings with the same name. The king in the north is named Jehoram. The king in the south is also named Jehoram. The Jehoram in the north is the brother of Ahaziah. So Ahab, just like I mentioned a couple weeks ago, Ahab is the first northern king to actually have some ancestors, and he has three three people follow in his footsteps and take the throne. He's really the first dynasty in the northern kingdom of Israel. And so he has his his son, um, he has Ahab, Ahaziah, and now Jehoram. All right, now, Jehoshaphat, Je- Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat, is now the new king in the southern kingdom. And so it gets difficult because now you're dealing with two kings of the same name, but they rule two different areas, and they're not related. They're not the same person. Um, So I'll do my best to make sure you know what's going on. Now, the rest of the acts of Ahaziah, which he did, are they not written in the books of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel? Um, Which means we have no idea, because we don't have that book. We have the Chronicles of the kings of Judah, not Israel. And then we get to chapter 2. So that was Ahaziah's wonderful reign, He basically did nothing. He hurt himself, and then he tried to get help from a pagan god. God cursed him and wiped out his soldiers, uh, and the kingdom went to his brother. That was one of Elijah's last acts, as he called down fire from heaven multiple times again. Chapter 2. It came to pass, when the Lord was about to take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind, that Elijah went from Elisha to Gilgal. Now, we already get some insight about of what's about to happen. You see, Elijah's going to be taken up into heaven by a whirlwind. Um, Now, this gives us the argument for the possible other witness. So, like I said, one of the two witnesses in Revelation is almost undoubtedly Elijah. There's almost no debate. The other major player for the potential role of the second witness, other than Moses, who I think it is because of the description and the transfiguration, is Enoch. In Genesis chapter 5, Enoch never dies. He just suddenly walks with God, much like Elijah. So he's the other major candidate for the second witness. So then Elijah said to Elisha, stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to Bethel. So Elijah tells his, his student to 
stay here because Elijah knows what's about to happen. We don't know if Elisha does or not at this point, but I, we don't know why he asks Elisha to stay behind. We don't know what's going on. We can conjecture a lot of things. Maybe Elijah wants to be by himself in his ministry. We've already seen him kind of retreat after doing something bold and want to be by himself for a while. Maybe that's it, but we don't know. But anyway, he's asking Elisha to stay behind. But Elisha says, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they went to Bethel. Now, what are they doing? They're actually going to see other prophets, other people who are being trained to be prophets of God. And they're traveling around seeing other students who are training to be prophets. But Elisha was the one who was taking on the mantle of Elijah. Even though they're going to see these other prophets, Elisha is the one who is already anointed to be the next version of Elijah. So now the sons of the prophets who were at Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? And he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. So this is puts this verse into perspective when you know what's going on. Because if you just read it randomly, you're wondering, what is this attitude? I don't even understand what he's saying. But what's happening is Elisha is now aware that his mentor, Elijah, is being taken up to heaven. He knows that he's going away. And I imagine he's probably pretty sad about it. And as these other students and other other guys who are training to be prophets come up to him and bring it up, he says, I know, I don't want to talk about it. He's trying to deal with it. So then Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to Jericho. And so now he asks him again to stay behind. And now it's starting to look like maybe it's a test. We Still, we don't know what is going on. Maybe Elijah wants to be by himself. Maybe because he knows he's going away. Maybe he's a guy who just hates goodbyes. But either way, this could also just be a test to see how faithful Elisha is. But Elisha's response is, um, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. Now the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho came to Elisha and said to him, do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? So he answered, yes, I know. Keep silent. And so they they get under his skin again and they bring it up. Hey, you know Elijah's going away today. And he says, yes, shut up. I, I don't want to talk about it. So Elijah said, at this other school of prophets, Elijah says to him, stay here for the Lord has sent me on to the Jordan. But Elisha again says, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. And the fifty men of the sons of the prophets went and stood facing them at a distance. While the two of them stood by the Jordan, now Elijah took his mantle, or his, his cloak, rolled it up, and struck the water. And it was divided this way and that, so that the two of them crossed over on dry ground. And so it was, when they had crossed over, that Elijah said to Elisha, Ask, what may I do for you? before I am taken away from you. And Elisha said, Please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. Let's stop and pause on that for a moment. This is a pretty tender moment. Elijah has been trying to get by himself all day as he knows he's leaving everyone behind. Elisha refuses to leave his side. He knows his master, his teacher, his mentor is going away. He's getting caught up to heaven. And he has this last moment and Elijah says to him, what, what can I possibly do for you? This amazing student that's been with him. And his student says, can you give me a double portion of what you got? Which sounds selfish, but it's not. What's really going on is Elisha is fully aware of the kind of prophet Elijah is. And he recognizes that he needs more access to the Spirit of God than Elijah did to be as useful. Because he has 
such a high view of who Elijah is, he recognizes he needs more of God's help to be as useful as Elijah was. I think that that's a pretty humble thing to ask for and something that I wish I was able to see clearly enough on my own for a long time, that I need more of God's help to do the ministry God has called me to do than to rely on myself. And that's true for all of us, whatever we're called to do, to ask for more of the Spirit of God to guide us because we want to be everything that he calls us to. So that is what he asks. And Elijah said, you have asked a hard thing. Really, he's saying, you've asked me something I can't guarantee you. It's not mine to give. You've asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I am taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if not, it shall be so. So basically he's saying, if you see me when I'm taken, then uh, good for you. You're going to get what you've asked for. If you don't see me when I'm taken, well, then that request was denied because God's the one who gets to make the choice. So then it happened as they continued and talked that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Verse 12, and Elisha saw it and he cried out, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and its horsemen. So he saw him no more and he took hold of his own clothes and tore them into two pieces. So he's, he's mourning the loss of his teacher. But the interesting thing is he saw it. That section, I would highlight that or circle that because that's going to come back around later on in Elisha's ministry. Elisha got a glimpse into the spiritual world and he got to witness what it looks like and he shares that with someone later down the road. So remember it. But he saw it, which means his request has been granted, the double portion of spirit. So verse 13, he also took up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood by the bank of the Jordan. Then he took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water. Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he had struck the water, it was divided this way and that, and Elijah crossed over. Now this is an interesting moment. One, for the funny reason in my head, is what I picture is this cloak and it feels like he's towel whipping the water. You know what I'm talking about? You get it wet, you roll it up. That's how I picture this moment. But the real reason this is interesting is there are now four people in the biblical canon that have separated water and been able to walk on dry ground by God's power. Moses and Joshua, Elijah and Elisha. So the interesting thing is again playing into the two witnesses and who they are that Elijah and Moses were the two teachers who were able to separate water and they handed that power off to their students Joshua and Elisha making it to me seem even more clear that Moses is going to be the second witness could be wrong but it is interesting to say the least that also separates these characters in the biblical canon as unique because they're the only four that have done this. So the water of the Jordan has been separated. Now, when the sons of the prophets who were from Jericho saw him, they said, the spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed to the ground before him. Now, this is very similar to what happened with Joshua crossing the Jordan. That proved to the rest of the Israelites that the power that Moses had was given to Joshua, that the command of the Israelites and the connection to God that Moses had was now handed over to Joshua. So now the rest of the prophets have seen that Elisha is the new guy, and it's the separation of water that has proven that to the rest of the prophets, just like with Moses and Joshua. So then they said, to him, look, now there are 50 strong men with your servants. Please let them go and search for your master, lest, lest perhaps the spirit of the Lord has taken him up and cast him upon some mountain into some valley. And he said, you shall not send anyone. So these guys, all they saw is Elijah is gone. They don't know what happened. And they're thinking, 
maybe God cast him to some other location. Let's go search for him. And Elisha says, no, I know what happened. Don't, don't search. That's a wild goose chase. But when they urged him till he was ashamed, he said, send them. Therefore, they sent 50 men and they searched for three days, but did not find him. When they came back to him, for he had stayed in Jericho, he said to them, did I not say to you, don't go? Then the men of the city said to Elisha, please notice the situation of the city is pleasant as my Lord sees. But the water is bad and the ground barren. And he said to them, bring me a new bowl and put salt in it. So they brought it to him and then he went out to the source of the water and cast in the salt there and said, thus says the Lord, I have healed this water from it. There shall be no more death or barrenness. Now way back in the book of Joshua, after Jericho was conquered, there was a curse put on the city and wasn't supposed to be habitable. Now, apparently they rebuilt the city, but we're still dealing with bad water and water that was contaminated. And this is Elisha bringing an end to that full circle. And interestingly, again, we now see Elisha connected to Joshua, just like Elijah is connected to Moses. So the water remains healed to this day, according to the word of Elisha, which he spoke. Then he went up from there to Bethel. And as he was going up the road, some youths came from the city and mocked him and said to him, Go up, you bald head. Go up, you bald head. Now, what is really happening here? It, it, it doesn't say children. It says youth. So we're probably talking about teenagers, young men. Uh, and it appears that they're, they're shouting some sort of slur at him, probably related to his faith. Um, or at least mocking him because of who he is, as opposed to their pagan faith that they've taken on from being in the northern kingdom and following in that the pagan rituals. And they probably become so enamored with that that these kids are just gone. Like they have become non believers of the God of Israel, and now they are mocking God's prophet. So, Elisha, he turned around and looked at them and pronounced a curse on them in the name of the Lord. And two female bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 of the youths. Then he went from there to Mount Carmel, and from there he returned to Samaria. So, weird story, um, but not shocking in the way that the Bible continues to work. It does seem throughout the story of Scripture when someone takes on the mantle of being a prophet or God does some miraculous move or sets someone up as the leader of a, of a movement that they tend to be mocked or something silly happens and then a judgment is pronounced. Now you see it with Elijah caused the drought and then he called down the fire on Mount Carmel. You see it with in the New Testament with um there were two two people that said that they uh they gave they sold their field and now they're giving all of their money to the church and they lie to the church and then they like die instantly in the book of acts again because god is presenting this person as very serious as someone you listen to because he is bringing the word of god to you you take him seriously and so this interesting thing happens but I would say over the first couple of chapters, the most interesting parts of it, or the things to really take a hold of, is one, again, humility before God and how it prevents judgment from coming to you. We see two captains of 50 men come with hubris and they try to order Elijah uh, after ah Ahaziah is uh, really arrogant and thinks he's in control. And with their overconfidence, they get fire called down from heaven upon them. But the third captain comes and he comes humbly and he kneels before Elijah and he asks for mercy. And what does God do? He grants mercy. If you're humble before God, you get mercy. So it's that simple. Be humble. And then the other really interesting thing is the constant parallel between Moses and Elijah and Joshua and Elisha. And I think that that's incredibly interesting because... What did Jesus fulfill? The law 
and the prophets. And Moses is the representative of the law, and Elijah is the representative of the prophets. And then you have this future before he comes again in the second coming, who comes to proclaim what is going to happen. Two witnesses who bear a very similar resemblance to Moses and Elijah, the law and the prophets, for the ultimate fulfillment of all of Scripture to take place in the second coming of Christ. So with that, let's pray. Father God, thank you. Thank you for this. God, I, I'm humbled. I hope that I have the wisdom of Elisha to recognize the great men and women in ministry who have done so much and written so much and have understood so much that I stand on the shoulders of. I get access to their books so I don't have to have the divine wisdom because you already gave it to them. And I get to stand on that and teach from a position of privilege because I, I already have access to so much of what they've already done. For me to not get hubris or overconfident because of what I think you've given me, but instead to be humble and recognize I need so much more of your spirit because I'm not them. I'm not Charles Spurgeon. I'm not Billy Graham. None of us are. But if we can humble ourselves before you, we can have access to your spirit and to your mercy. And if you're willing to flow through us, we can have the tools necessary to make an impact where you need it to be made. So help us have that. In Jesus' name, amen.